Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this 59th Leadership Conversation. Uh, today, we have with us uh, an esteemed guest, Dr. Shantanu Paul, uh, who's going to talk about uh, from UPI to CBDC, the rise and rise of digital money. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Shantanu Paul. Welcome, sir, and good evening. Yes, thank you. Wonderful to be here. Sorry, I was on mute and I was not visible. But thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. Great, sir. I'll just uh, take one more moment to uh, finish this uh, small presentation and then hand it over back to you, sir. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, uh, these are wise use leadership conversations. We hold these every Friday, Friday evenings generally. And today we have uh, uh, Dr. Shantanu Paul. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, a very interesting uh, topic that most of us would like to uh, know more as we are found wanting uh, in terms of the knowledge, in terms of the emerging digital currencies around the world, especially in India, as well as the government has uh, made a promise to uh, launch uh, its uh, digital currency. Probably it is going to be launched in the early next year, 2023. So the agenda for this session is the first uh, 25 minutes or so, or first half an hour, uh, and a presentation will be made by the guest, uh, Dr. Shantanupal, followed by uh, another 30 minutes or 35 minutes of Q&A. The Q&A will be moderated by Professor Prasad and uh, myself. So it's my privilege and uh, honor to introduce uh, the speaker. Dr. Shantanu is an entrepreneur, technocrat, and opinion writer. He is the co-founder and the chief executive of Talent Sprint, which is a digital upskilling and bootcamp platform for professionals who are in search of deep and disruptive skills. The platform aims to equip and empower 1 million professionals and knowledge workers in the fields of information technology, banking, financial services, and education by 2025. Talent Sprint has received more than 15 national and international awards and raised equity capital from Nexus Venture Partners and Angel Investors. Uh, Dr. Shantanu held several positions uh, from 2003 to 2008. He worked for Virtuza Corporation as Senior Vice President for Global Delivery Operations and Head of Indian Operations. And he was part of the global leadership team when the company went public on NASDAQ in 2007. From 1999 to 2003, Dr. Shantanu worked as CTO at uh, Viveka and uh, Open Pages, both venture backed technology firms based in Boston. From 95 to 98, he was a computer scientist and IBM's prestigious TJ Watson Research Lab in Yorktown Heights, New York. That's very, very interesting. Some of you must be knowing uh, Dr. Shantanu received his BTEC from IIT Madras and his PhD from the University of Michigan, both in computer sciences. His academic record over time earned him the Rackham Doctoral Fellowship, the IBM Canada Fellowship, the Lacroote Fellowship, and the National Talent Search Scholarship. He made several publications. He is an author or co-author of 20 international technology papers and two United States patents. He is an independent board director at the National Payments Corporation of India and NSDL Payments Bank. Dr. Shantanu is a popular conference speaker and panel moderator, and his op-ed pieces and columns appear frequently in media. So that's briefly about uh, our esteemed guest uh, who is present with us uh, this evening. Without much ado, I now request uh, Dr. Shantanu Paul to start his session. Over to you, sir. Thank you and welcome once again. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dr. Rao. I appreciate your tenacity in uh, making sure that I show up for this eventually. I know we've been talking for a long time. And thank you, uh, Professor Prasad, also for being here as a moderator. And I extend my appreciation to all the participants who are on the call. If you give me just a second, I'm going to put up my presentation. So please give me a second to do that. So I'm going to talk about UPI to CBDC, which has been a very exciting journey um, for all of us. Um, I hope you can all hear me. I'm assuming that's clear, presentation and audio, right? Yes, sir, both. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about the rise and rise of digital money in India um, and uh, it can also call it the unstoppable rise of digital money in India because I think we've reached a point where this is not going to be reversible, the momentum that has been built. And as, it was, as was kindly pointed out, some of the perspectives I share here is from my stint at uh, the board of NPCI, which is essentially the owner operator of the UPI protocol and API uh, for the last five years. I was there for since 2016 to 2021 on the board as an independent director. And also I was the chairman of the NPCI Innovation Council, which played a significant role in creating industry collaboration across the banking and fintech sector to essentially build, enhance, and continue to make UPI the powerhouse it has become. 
right? So some of that perspective also will probably come into the talk. So I, I'm uh, cognizant of the fact that there is um, um, sort of a 25, 30 minute limit in which I'll hopefully cover my slides. Um, but then after that, I'm sure the discussion and interaction will be even more exciting. So uh, I'm going to basically show you that, you know, uh, Jamie Diamond, who I'm sure many of you know, is a very well-known um, banker. He is the chairman of uh, JP Morgan Chase for many, many years. Uh, many years ago, about 20, 25 years ago, I remember this very distinctly. I was at that time uh, just starting my career. He made this point that a modern bank is a technology company in disguise, right? And I want you to reflect on that concept as we go along. Um, and then if you look at another comment that was made not so long after that particular comment was by Bill Gates himself, in which he said another very provocative thing. He said, all of us need banking, but do we really need banks? Right? So the separation of the noun from the verb is important because banking, once it becomes a service, you know, it doesn't really have to be delivered from what we consider to be a traditional bank. And that's an important uh, observation. The third vice person that I'm going to refer to is Mark Andreessen. Uh, those of you who follow technology and remember the uh, heady years of the 90s when the World Wide Web came into existence, uh, initially, when uh, Tim Berners-Lee launched the World Wide Web, um, it was essentially a bunch of hyperlinks. There was no way to navigate it very well. And we had very, very rudimentary text-based browsers. And the first browser that really kind of broke into the open, the visual, busy big kind of browser was Mosaic, which came from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign Research. And Mark Anderson was the PhD student who wrote that. And of course, Mark Anderson then went on to become the co-founder of Netscape. Netscape became as famous as it did. It went into battle with uh, Microsoft against Internet Explorer. There was a whole bunch of so 10 years worth of lawsuits and antitrust against Microsoft. All that is now water under the bridge. But Mark Anderson became famous as um, first the inventor of the Mosaic browser and then co-founder of Netscape. And then finally, of course, now he's a very famous venture capitalist, as you probably all know. And what did he say? He said a long time ago that software is eating our world, uh, which essentially is a reflection of the fact that a lot of traditional industries uh, are going through or have gone through some serious disruption. If you look at books, uh, and if you look at basic uh, general retail merchandising, I mean, Amazon has now is now a household name, just like Flipkart for all of us. And, you know, I think e-commerce e is now more powerful than Main Street commerce, right, in terms of how we buy things. WhatsApp, good example, disrupted telecom, right? The power of at and and Verizon diminished as over time we had Skype and WhatsApp kind of calls and messengers, which made communication free and global and transparent and seamless. Uh, Uber, Uberization is a term now, which means that how do you create this gig economy and you create resources that, are, that you don't own, but you can actually use them and aggregate them. So the power of aggregation. Airbnb, similar aggregation of uh, hotel rooms. It's the biggest hotel company in the world without single room that it owns. Apple, now the biggest provider of music in the world because of music is digital and iTunes is the biggest music store. And LinkedIn, which is the recruiting platform, you know, entire recruiting industry has transformed and disrupted because of LinkedIn. So long story short, I think the idea that software industry or software companies are eating into traditional industry and disrupting them is now nothing new. I mean, we are all used to it. We've gotten very familiar with it. So let me take a moment to step back and see what has happened in banking and financial services. For 100 years or more, banking was a very sort of, I would say, a very sort of privileged, highbrow profession. In fact, I like to say that banking and financial services, or banks in particular, uh, you know, they were like churches and temples. You know, people went to them with a lot of respect. You know, if you are a customer of a large bank, uh, and I'm sure this is not, uh, not yet changed in parts of India as well, you know, the, the bank manager in the regional branch, the zonal branch or office is a bit of a mini emperor, right? Or empress, and you go there and you pay your respects and you kind of hope to get serviced, this is how banking has been. It's always been a very highbrow profession, a highbrow uh, sort of uh, sector. So the idea was that you know banks were very important institutions. They were top-down directed. They were focused on their internal policy. And in some sense, they were in a command and control world. They dictated policy to the consumer. And the, you, know, you were kind of felt privileged to be able to have a bank account. And, uh, you know, and you would go stand in line to get service for your banking needs. And that has been the history for many, many decades. Institutions would prescribe. So the bank institutions were like powerful and they wrote the rules of engagement by which the consumer and the, you know, the so-called customer would engage with them. And I still remember very well, even in my own uh, young days, childhood or college days, and it was going to the bank, getting a token for a teller and then waiting in line. God knows when you get your service done, get your cash out of a human teller. And those are like really clear, vivid memories of banks being very highbrow institutions. 
And consumers had no choice but to comply. Much like a temple or a church, when you go, the timing is fixed. You can't go at the wrong time. You have to go at the right time. You have to stand in a queue. You go in there. They tell you what the entrance is. They tell you what the exit is. They tell you, you know, how you can worship, how long you can be. And those of you who have been to some of the biggest temples in the country, and you know exactly what I mean. There are protocols of engagement which you can't violate. And if you violate them, they'll just throw you out of the temple because you are essentially in non-compliance, right? So that was the model of banking and financial service for the longest time. But what has fintech done? Fintech has turned all this upside down. And the so-called church is now just a bazaar. It's just a marketplace. It's a noisy, chaotic marketplace. It is no longer structured, no longer top-down command control. The, the institution does not control the behavior of the consumer. The consumer decides how to engage with the institution. So it's gone from being top-down to bottom-up, from inside-out rule prescription to outside-in engagement. Uh, fintechs want to have conversations with their customers, not dictate anything to the customers. And consumers also have choice. They want to decide where they want to buy what financial product from. It's all gotten unbundled. You know, the bank as a single source of bundled financial services have gotten unbundled. And UPI is a good example. We'll talk a lot about that today. So instead of the previous model of the church and this temple where the, the person who is getting the service, the consumer, uh, the consumer had to comply with the institution. Now the institution is complying with the consumer's needs or adapting to the consumer's expectations, right? Uh, this idea of mobile banking, the idea that the, the phone is your bank and the bank is 24 by 7, you want to get service at 2 a.m. in the morning. If there's no bot or there's no help desk, you think your bank is bad and you don't think this bank is worth it. So, so there's a whole set of things that have changed. And democratization of banking may be another way to put it. Uh, it's very clear that the power has moved out of the hands of these institutions into the hands of those who are consuming it. And that tilt of power and the shift of the power is what we're going to talk about. Okay, so now switching gears and coming into our topic of today, UPI, Unified Payment Interface. I'm sure not a single person in this room is immune to that, the charm of this wonderful you know, capability that we all have in our phones. If you might be using GPay or Amazon Pay or Phone Pay or Paytm, it doesn't quite matter. All of them are riding on UPI. Right. It is the first example in the history of Indian technology where an API built out of India that truly made make in India truly Atmanirbhar API is the API that every Silicon Valley company is using to run the payment rails. Right in India and now hopefully even beyond because UPI now has an international uh, presence that they're trying to build and countries across the world want to emulate the UPI framework. So for a change, instead of, you know, we Indian technologists building on Silicon Valley APIs, Silicon Valley companies are building on Indian APIs. So there's a bit of a, uh, there's a bit of, I would say, you know, uh, a bit of a chuckle that we can have from that. The tables have turned. And I think UPI was the first one that really made this possible. Now, why is UPI so successful? At a very simple level, you'll see the volumes in a minute. I'm sure I'll show you all the, you know, numbers. But more than that, I think the most important innovation of UPI has been the ability to make a payment look as simple as sending an email, right? If you look at RTGS, NEFT, and IMPS, and before that checks, any transfer from me to you would require me to know details about your bank account. You have to give me your bank IFSC code, you have to give a bank account number, you have to give a bank account name. So essentially, you're starting to divulge private information about your banking, you know, where you do banking, what account number you have. So if you think your bank account number is something that should be kept private, the, well, guess what? RTGS and EFT and IMPS will not help you. You will have to disclose to me as a sender and you as a recipient all this private information for you to get money from me, right? So I'll ask you for that. I'll set you up as a you know a payee on my bank account and then I'll do the transfer, right? So that is the fundamental nature of banking for you know forever, digital payments. Moment the UPI comes in, we all get a virtual address. Right? I become Shantanu at City Bank. You become Sudhakar at SBI, and, and Prasad becomes Prasad at uh, Bank of Baroda. Right? It's just a, like an email ID. It's virtualized. Behind that email ID, or equal, we call it the virtual payment identifier, VPA, v, virtual payment address. Behind that VPA, you may be connected to any bank, any account, multiple bank accounts, and none of us will know that. When I send you the money, I send it to Sudhakar at SBI and Sudhakar decides which bank account he's going to put into. And I don't have to know, and I don't want to know, nor does he want to tell me, ideally in an ideal world, what accounts he has and where and what their numbers are, right? So first thing that we, this UPI did was make this abstraction, layer of abstraction, which allows us to all have a virtual payment address and not have to know anything more about each other and preserve this privacy. And once you look at email, you know, if my email is sitting on Gmail server, yours on Outlook server, I don't really have to know anything. Your email address is enough for me to send you an email. That entire 
you know, sort of uh, the entire complexity of your server versus my server, you know, the interoperability, all that is hidden behind this beautiful, elegant layer of an email address. Similarly, a payment address takes care of that problem. So once you do that, you suddenly realize that everybody is in a position to transact and exchange money with minimum friction. The amount of set, the concept setting up, you know, why do you think it's so easy to pay on uh, VPI? And we all love to pay UPI micropayments because the cost of setting up is zero, right? We don't have to set up somebody and wait for a certain amount of time for the bank to approve a cooling off period and all that good stuff. So that is the first and foremost reason why there is such a significant, you know, traction. The, the It becomes frictionless payments, basically. And then if I move to the next um, point, and then what has it led to? This has led to in the last, uh, I would say, uh, since December 2016, is when uh, demonetization happened. I'm sure all of you remember that very well. When you look at demonetization, UPI was just at that point coming out of, you know, it's just being born, right? It was just like a newly born baby. It was in its infancy. And, uh, and a few months into, I think May 2016, it was officially launched. And uh, November 2016, the demon happens. And I remember very clearly, I was in the, I just joined the board of NPCI at that time. Uh, it was very interesting. That first month, we took the data and we found 1 million, million with an M, 1 million transactions of UPI in the entire month of December 2016, the month of demonetization. And you might remember the prime minister was out there saying that everybody go digital payments. Paytm was putting out full pages. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for making this happen. You know, we're all doing so well because of all this. And there's a lot of hoopla that happened. But the point is that that was the turning point for a great architecture, like I just described, a very simple, elegant way of transferring money from each other. And then you add to that this major demonetization push, and all of a sudden, UPI gathers steam. And it's a shocker to know today that uh, we are now at a point, if you look at the number, 5.58 billion transactions, billion with a B, in uh, the month of uh, April 22, which is most recent data that we have. So you look at the explosive rise, that's like a 5,000x growth, right? From 1 million to 5 billion is a 5,000x growth in transactional volume in a matter of, you know, six years or five and a half years. No API in the history of the world has reached this kind of scale in such a short time. And this is both the transaction volume and the transaction value. And we talk about volume mostly because that's an easier one to compare. This is now at a point where annualized growth rate of this usage of the API volume is 100% plus, and that means that you know that's a really remarkable growth rate. It's gone from just a person-to-person -person transfer to person-to-merchant transfer, and we are all paying a lot of our regular merchant payments with it. We're not just passing money from each other, so it's essentially a way of transacting e-commerce and transacting you know digitally on merchant uh, sites, both stores and online. There are 50 plus digital applications available on Play Store or in which which actually are, I mean, just talked about the popular ones, but every bank has its own application for helping UPI. There are 250 plus banks that are, uh, you know, uh, on it. There are 250 million unique users in this country today who have a unique UPI ID or a unique UPI identifier. And there are 50 million merchants who are re receiving transactions and payments on UPI, right? So this is like going from zero to you know, a billion uh, miles an hour in a six year period. So I just wanted to emphasize to you what an explosive growth this is and how rare it is in the history of technology to have such an explosive adoption rate. So you know, all of us, I mean, uh, those of us who are in the technology industry and computer science is kind of, we have been living this world for a long time. We take a great pride historically to say we're building enterprise class applications. When a company builds something that many, many, many customers can use its enterprise class, like Oracle is enterprise class application, let's say, right? Or DB2 database or enterprise, or SAP is enterprise class application. And we all took pride in saying enterprise class is the biggest thing that we can do. Well, UPI has blown past all that. It's not enterprise class, it's citizen scale, right? It's citizen scale, it has reached a point where every citizen in the country can seamlessly operate. So that's an order of magnitude, higher complexity and reach that UPI has achieved. So enterprise scale, is literally nothing compared to the citizen scale that we are now observing. And I, the other example, of course, in India is Aadhaar. Aadhaar is another great example of citizen scale, right? Everybody is on it and it works and it's seamless. Now, just to take a little bit of detour from UPI to say that how NPCI, which is the owner operator of UPI, is also doing a lot of other things, which is not necessarily UPI, but UPI related. You all know that, you know, if you're on the highway, uh, certainly ORR is a good example, Fastag, we are all on Fastag, right? Fastag is also an NPCI product. 
Its underlying technology is called NETC, National Electronic Toll Collection System. Then if you look at what is happening with metros, buses, smart cities, etc. Um, I know even Fastag, by the way, will soon have uh, not just highways, but also parking. You can park with Fastag going forward in parking lots, right? Then there'll be this, there's this National Common Mobility Card, NCMC, which runs on Rupee, which is our uh, NPCI or India's answer to Visa and Master. Rupee, um, the credit card operating network. So the Rupee card, one of them is NCMC, which is also now being promoted as a single card for making all payments across all transportation, right? So whether you're in a metro or a bus in a big city. So imagine you are you preload your car, you go to Delhi metro, you use it. You go to Calcutta, you go to Kolkata metro, you can use it. You come down to Hyderabad, you can use it. You can get into a bus and use it. So the complete national interoperable transportation card. Now that's quite an achievement when, when we actually make that fully possible. The point I'm making is UPI has reached a certain scale. Fastag is on its way there, becoming very, very big already. And uh, NCMC is probably in its earlier stage of development, but it will also get there. The point I'm making is this is not just one trick pony that we are talking about. This country is going digital payments wise on all fronts, firing on all cylinders. But the last point I want to make here is, of course, financial inclusion. I mean, for the longest time, uh, those of you who study financial inclusion, and I remember, you know, banks used to say, oh my God, you know, we want to add another 1 million, 2 million, 3 million. Um, you know, merchants uh, to have point of sale devices and those hardware devices were very difficult. But if you now look at QR code based merchants, right? You just go and go to merchant, there's a sticker, you point and you click and you pay. That has become very big, but not just that, the entire direct benefit system. So today, you know, Aadhaar enabled payment system has become the system of choice for the governments, both central and state to disburse direct benefits to people below a certain economic and socioeconomic means. And today we have, 5 million micro ATM, which is essentially business correspondence. If you know the VC model, there are human beings who are human ATMs carrying a device in the village in the last mile. And 400 million other enabled payment transactions, I mean, either withdrawal or cash withdrawal, cash deposit transactions, or micro ATM transactions are happening on AEPS, which is much bigger than the ATM network that we have in the country. So therefore now, again, AEPS is an NPCI product. So I just give you four examples, UPI, right? then um, uh, Fastag, and then I'm talking about NCMC, which is Rupee, and then I'm talking about APS. They're all transformational citizen scale applications. And I think India would probably be the only country in the world with such a widespread rollout happening on all fronts concurrently. Okay, so let's deconstruct and step back and reconstruct this whole revolution of UPI, right? Why has it been possible? The answer that one can say, we just got very lucky. I think we got very lucky, there's no doubt about it, but you also, I think we've been very thoughtful and a lot of events have helped. For example, the smartphone adoption in this country in the last 10 years has been remarkable, right? So that continues to be the primary enabler or tailwind for all these various momentum we are seeing. So that's number one. Number two, proactive regulation. Unlike other central banks in the world, which have allowed even China for being such a big giant in fintech, has allowed two monopoly players to essentially corner the market and become completely private owned networks of payments, Alipay and WeChat, right? But for whatever reason, Indian regulators, banking regulators, RBI had the vision to have the payment settlement tax set up NPCI, create a collaborative, you know, all banks will be shareholders of a single institution. It'll be section eight company, nonprofit, all of the structural decisions to say that digital payment is a social and public good. It is not a profit making entity. And that proactive regulation has really created this open architecture. The open architecture is huge, which is why every API and every app in the world, app maker in the world can use UPI to build their apps. Nobody can stop them because it's open architecture, it's open APIs. And in the spirit of open banking, which is another big thing, this is one of the prime examples of how you can build a platform that anybody can build their application on and transfer money between uh, entities and people. FinTech partnerships. I think I mentioned this before, but if you look at Google, look at Amazon, look at uh, Apple, look at Samsung, I mean, you look at, uh, uh, then Indian giants, so it's phone pay, then Paytm, everybody has gone ahead and partnered with NPCI on UPI, right? So there, so UPI has not tried to be all things to all people. It says we build a great platform, we give a good API, but we don't want to control the customer experience. Consumer experience, how to give them a good experience making payments, that is not NPCI's problem, right? That is controlled by the tech companies or the banks or the financial institutions. So that kind of collaborative partnership, knowing that we will control the backend and the interoperability while you as banks and fintechs can control the user experience. That relationship also has done a lot for this uh, success. And of course, the last thing, not to not last but the least, the deep tech advances in data sciences, AI and machine learning are a huge part of it. I mean, I'll show you in a second the kind of numbers we're talking about, but 
you know, today, the just even if there is 2% fraud on send or collect transactions on UPI, that run into multi-million number of fraud payments a day and stopping those payments, using technology, detecting fraud, correcting them on the fly, yet not stopping good transactions and yet stopping the fraudulent transactions. If you know your statistics, you know, type one, type two errors, managing them really well. All that is possible only because we have now machine learning algorithms which can do this. Apologies, I, I want to show you this slide. I think I forgot. This is an important slide. I want to highlight the numbers, right? I talked about a million a month in December. And uh, I talked about how we have reached, we reached a billion a month, a billion a month in June 2019, a billion a week in March 2022, which is just recently. And the question then becomes when does it become a billion, billion transactions per day architecture? And the current prediction is 2025, right? So think about it. Starting in 2016, in 2025, in 10 years flat, you build a billion transactions a day, which essentially is the equivalent of saying that every citizen does at least one UPI transaction a day given the size of our country, which is not a mean feat, right? Okay, so I'll stop there for a minute just to collect our thoughts to say that UPI, I think, has been a huge success story. But the question then, you know, uh, that, that, that that is front of us is that what happens after this, right? This is an engine that has really kind of taken off. And where is the country trying to go? What are the regulators trying to do? And that is where the second part of my talk from UPI to CBDC, right? How do you go from UPI to CBDC? Now, CBDC is, is, is an... CBD is an important concept, and it's something that is everywhere now. People are talking about it all around the world, but it's a concept that I think can be easily confused in 15 different ways, and a lot of people I talk to are unsure of what it means and unsure of why it's useful and why do we need it. And that's a classic question. Why do I need this? I have UPI. Why do I need CBDs? So my goal in the next few slides is to try to help you understand why CBDC is important. Why is everybody so concerned about making it happen? And how is it different than what we can already do using UPI or other digital payment means, right? So that's the starting point for this CBDC part. Okay, so first question, so what does CBDC stand for? It stands for Central Bank Digital Currencies, right? And uh, at the first glance, uh, if you do some quick research, you will realize that every central bank worth their salt right now is chasing some CBDC project. You know, it, it is, uh, of course, China was the first one to launch it uh, in 2020 with a very successful pilot across multiple districts. And then now they're going full hog. And I think they will be the first nation to have a serious digital currency. And we'll talk about what that means. India has been kind of a little bit cautious, unlike in UPI, where RBI has been a world leader. Uh, in the case of CBDC, RBI has been a bit of a cautious follower. And I think China moving into the whole thing, and then within the pandemic, the U.S. government talking about it, then a whole bunch of, you know, sort of these uh, highly digital countries like Estonia and others going, you know, in the Baltics and the Nordic countries. So slow, bit by bit, Singapore Monetary Authority, bit by bit, I think now it's impossible to be, it's become a wave, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, the, at some point, you know, the price of not being part of it becomes bigger than the price of being part of it. So now we reach that point where if some country says, I'm not doing CBDC, you have to worry about their sanity, right? So that's where we are right now. So every country is doing something. Every central bank is doing something. So the first question, before I describe what it is, let me describe why it is happening, right? I think no central bank will officially state this and admit it. But in my view, and I think the view of a lot of people, the rise of cryptocurrencies, especially the success of Bitcoin and uh, Ether, for, has literally scared the hell out of central banks. Because the idea is that if more and more people buy into the idea that there is a cryptocurrency out there that's outside of regulation and doesn't have any nation state controlling it, there's no sovereign that controls that currency. The fear is that you know the states will lose power and governments will fall and central banks will become toothless. This fear of not being able to regulate currency is a very, very real and mortal fear, which has led central banks to essentially have to react. So there's a reactionary approach that you see here, because essentially this argument that we say that if you can't beat them, then you might as well join them, right? So in some sense, CBDC is, in that, is, a, is a response in that direction, that all the central banks have realized that they can't stop digital currencies in the form of crypto, privately regulated currencies. If public is going to take them, buy them, invest in them, and use them to pay, then we might as well do something in the form of digital currency so that this stem, we can at least articulate that, look, I have a formal digital currency, don't go for the informal ones. So that's the number one point that I want to make. 
And interestingly enough, uh, this is of course slightly dated information. I didn't have more updated data. I couldn't find one. But last year, when I looked, crypto capital, uh, the crypto you know market cap across the world had overtaken India's GDP, right? So crypto market cap globally would have been equal to being the fifth or sixth largest GDP in the world, right? If you look at it from that perspective. So that tells you how big it is or how big it was. Of course, now the corrections have probably slaughtered 30, 40, 50 percent of that. But nevertheless, the point is proven that this is not a small thing to ignore. So first and foremost, uh, when, or, you know, I'm, I'm, frankly, if you uh, pay attention, and I probably shouldn't be saying this, but if you pay attention to some of the speeches made in the last six months by various you know, governors, deputy governors of Indian and other central banks, they have been trash talking, you know, cryptocurrencies. And I think that tells you how much they are scared about it. Because I don't see the need for a top central banker to come out and say bad things about something for long periods, unless they really think that's a threat to their own, uh, you know, sort of system. So that is, I think, one clear indication that this is being taken very seriously. So what exactly then is CBDC? Well, first and foremost, CBD is nothing but fiat money in digital form. Now, what is fiat money? Fiat money is what the sovereign backs. If you pull out your wallet and pull out a 100 rupee note, that is a fiat currency because anybody that you give that money to in exchange of services or goods will consider it to be instant settlement because if you read the let print in it, it says very clearly that you know this is backed by the full faith and you know full faith and whatever of the Reserve Bank of India, and therefore. Indian government essentially giving you a guarantee that this 100 rupee note, the receiver is guaranteed that 100 rupee note is real, the value is stable, and the value is not going to slide tomorrow morning, 100 rupees will not become 10 rupees the next morning. Right? So that bearer of that piece of paper, the bank note, as we call it, has assurance and have, that bank note has the full backing of the sovereign. That's what a fiat currency is, which is by, by definition, axiomatically, the currency of the country which will not be violated in the sense that its it value will not fall next morning, right? So that's number one. So therefore, there are two universes that are colliding here. One is the idea of the, sec the left circle that you see here, fiat currencies. Fiat currencies tend to be banknotes, could be coins. And history, if you go back, if you go back to the emperors, Ashoka and Kanishka, you would find metal coins as fiat currency. So fiat currency also has been evolving. And the most latest version, Chinese invented paper money, paper currencies in 700 AD. And Last thousand plus years, we have gotten used to the idea that paper money backed by a sovereign bank makes sense. So that's one part of it. That is the backed by the sovereign. That's the left circle. The right circle is any money that is in the form of, uh, in some form, digital money. So let me give you an example, right? So, so when you talk about, you know, if you are an economist, you talk about M0. M0 is your money supply, M0, which is to say that this is essentially all the banknotes in circulation, right? But if you take bank notes and you go to a bank yourself and open an account as a savings account, give that money in cash to the bank, the bank gives you a checkbook and an account and a debit card, the bank has converted that money to M1. So therefore, now this is a you have a demand on the bank. You don't have a demand on the RBI for that money, right? So essentially, that is M1. So the point I'm making is that CBDC essentially is considered to be the equivalent of a bank note. It's pegged one-on-one -on -one with the currency of the country. So one you know, uh, CBDC rupee will be the equivalent of one uh, rupee. It will be pegged. It will be backed by the full authority of the uh, bank. So it's like saying instead of going to the ATM and taking out paper, money, and putting it into your physical wallet, you will go to a website, and you will draw money from your account, and it will go into a digital wallet, and that wallet will now have your digital rupees, right? And when you go to pay somebody, you pay them digital rupees. So this is very important to understand that CBDC is digital but it's not just digital, right? It is more than digital. It is actually fully backed by the central bank to say that this is as good as paper money, right? Minus the trouble of paper money. Okay, so now I'll keep going. So why do people care about CBD so much? I mean, apart from the reactionary aspect of cryptocurrency, fear, et cetera, that I mentioned, there are actually great benefits to having CBDC going forward. So essentially, as paper money circulation, you know, starts paper becomes less and less, the government will issue more and more. The idea is that CBDC will issue more digital banknotes as opposed to physical banknotes, paper banknotes. There are multiple reasons why CBDCs are a great idea, that instead of having rupees in circulation in paper, let's have rupees in circulation in digital. And same with dollars, same with yuan, et cetera. The first is GDP efficiency. This is actually a very interesting fact that close to 1% of GDP is wasted in most countries trying to print, manage, recycle, and circulate physical paper bank notes. So paper money is a drag on the economy to the extent of 1% of GDP. 
Now you can get that back if it becomes digital, right? Because you know, paper money, we have, you know, sometimes you go back, torn, notes are torn, they have to pull money back in circulation, et cetera, and out of circulation, et cetera. The second big reason why it is good to have, and again, these perspectives are all from the, most of them from the perspective of the central bank and, I'll come, and the economy. I'll come to the retail person later. Monitoring, right? Uh, Anti-money laundering, right? Uh, combating terrorism financing, uh, tax evasion. All this becomes much harder in a world of CBDC because essentially once the money is in circulation digital form, it's a traceable money. Literally the Reserve Bank of India can trace the money on where it is and who currently has it. Unlike you know bags of cash, which clearly can become so anonymous and so invisible that can never be found uh, easily, right? So there is a monitoring aspect of it where you can say that a lot of corruption, a lot of other things that happen that are undesirable for economy will actually come down because of CBDC because traceability of the money and the monitoring of the financial system become much more easy with a purely digital and tech-based system platform. They look at uh, financial inclusion and distribution. This is a very important one. If there is a major crisis in a certain part of the country, think of Andaman Nicobar, let's say, and God forbid, they get hit by a cyclone, right? And then you want to get money out. You, know, you have to today, you know, send money out, put them into ATMs, get in the people's hands. I mean, but with the CBDC, RBI can straight away, or Ministry of Finance can straight away direct money into the, literally the digital pockets of people <clears throat> without an instant. And you don't have to physically transport the money, make it accessible. So in terms of targeted financial uh, aid distribution, it's very powerful, right? So financial inclusion, next stage. Other one is instantaneous clearance and set settlements. Very important. I mean, this is an area where you know, it's hard to explain how complex this is because when we, when I send you money, you send me money, NEFT, RTGS, IMPS, or even uh, UPI, there's an invisible settlement period. The money leaves my account, appears on account almost instantaneously. That we see in our accounts. But the banks haven't settled. They need another two, three days to settle all their open stuff. So their netting, their clearance settlement takes time. This is inefficient because any open transaction where the money has moved but the settlement is not complete is a risk. And risk has to be you know, backed up by either settlement funds, guarantee funds, or by insurance. So a lot of money gets put into figuring out how to manage unsettled transactions. So moment you say digital bank currency, the, the settlement is instantaneous, right? Just like when I give you a 100 rupee note, the person taking it just looks at it and says, is it a fake note? It's a real note, that's it. If it's a real note, they don't have to go and get somebody else to approve the settlement. The money settlement is instantaneous. Same will happen with digital CBDCs. CBDC. Citizen scale analytics. Imagine if you're RBI and you want to understand how people are spending money and what are the trends of the economy and where are people spending more money, less money. The kind of analytics you can derive when you have control and visibility of citizens' ownership of digital money is much higher. Like I said, paper money is so anonymous and it's so hard to trace that you can't get very good ideas of spend, but with digital CBDC, it'll become very easy to publish annual reports saying this is how the money is being spent by retail. Uh, all citizens spend money in this fashion. You can say in Sikkim, this is the way they spend, in Tamil Nadu, here's how they spend, right? You can get all that insight. And of course, efficient cross-border payments, which is a big story by itself. It's a discussion of its own topic. I don't have time for it, but international money transfer is a real pain in the neck for most countries. And other than SWIFT, last 50 years, the only monopoly of SWIFT, everything else is highly inefficient. The cost of global money transfer friction is 8%. So if you're moving $100, you are on average seven to $8 are being spent friction in terms of paying off all the intermediaries, right? So that can become almost near zero. So those are the good things. CBDC has a lot of great benefits. However, CBDC also has one obvious downside. We are essentially signing up for a surveillance state, right? It basically means that if all the good things I want to get on the left side, which are green, we will have to give up so much information about ourselves, so much transparency about ourselves that essentially the big brother will know pretty much what we're doing and some of the things that, you know, some of the things that we like to do where we don't want people to know what we're doing with that money, it will actually become traceable and technically traceable. Of course, the argument in CBDC world is that we will give protections. We will let people make something anonymous. Uh, if they want to, we'll give people uh, control over how much anonymity they want to have, how much privacy they want to have or don't want to have, what they want to reveal, etc. But all that is nice. But at the end of the day, once it's digital, we know that and a court order itself can unlock all those privacy, right? That's all it will take. Okay. So I'm almost ending my near of uh, ending the uh, nearing the end of my presentation. Um, sorry, one second. Yeah. So I won't have time for this, but architecturally, CBDCs are an interesting topic. So computer scientists labor over this problem that what kind of CBDC architecture should we have? Should we have one tier, two tier, which is this, you know, the direct CBDC basically should we, will we all have accounts 
with the RBI directly because RBI is issuing the money directly into those accounts. Indirect means that the banks will continue to play a role of intermediary. There'll be wholesale CBDC that RBI will give to banks and banks will give retail CBDC to us through wallets. So all those you know, two-tier, one-tier systems are being discussed. Hybrid systems are being discussed. Uh, there is terms like wholesale retail CBDC, which I talked about, account-based versus token-based, two-tier versus one-tier. Happy to take some questions on these if there are, there are any, but by and large, there's a whole technical architecture. But of course, we all know that CBDC runs on top of blockchain or what we call distributed ledger technology, and that is what makes it possible. The last but most important slide that I want you to really remember that I think the most exciting feature of CBDC, apart from being fiat digital money, is that CBDC essentially opens up the path for money to become programmable. Now, what does that mean? Moment you say a piece of banknote is digital, it is essentially a piece of code with the data, right? There is a piece of code, there's a piece of data that is actually making that digital banknote real. Of course, lots of cryptography, security, et cetera, tamper proof, et cetera, which all blockchain you get from all that. But the most important part is you can start doing things with CBDC that you could never do with paper money. So I'll take an example of that. Imagine if the government wants to give out you know, vouchers in CBDC to each of us. Each citizen in the country gets a voucher to say, hey, you know what? This is a CBDC voucher going to your digital CBDC wallet, which is our personal wallet on a phone. This CBDC voucher has 1,000 rupees in it. So you can take this and go to any vaccination center and get a shot of, let's say, Covaxin as an example, right? Now, the beauty of this model is, first of all, if it's given to you, you can program that uh, CBDC to say that the CBDC itself, 1,000 CBDC rupees to say it can't be transferred to somebody else other than Sudhakar, right? Sudhakar gets it. He can't give it to some his cousin, for example, or his neighbor. Second, so that can only use it for vaccinations and only for co-vaccine. Maybe you can go one level further. It's only for the second shot. The first shot is done. This is only for second shots, right? And most interestingly, if he fails to use it, it can expire. It can have an expiry date. So now think about the, if you look at now the government's efficiency of using resources, you can target it fit to purpose. You can restrict its misuse. You can time it out if it's not being used and recover the money. So for all these reasons, you know, CBDC is essentially to me open the world for programmable money, which is a very exciting field by itself. It's intersection of money with, you know, code, right? Code is now money, money is now code. So I just want to give that example to say that how would you think of, why would anybody want to program their money? Well, this is a good example of why you want to program money. It's fit for purpose. Money has been given by entity A to entity B for a particular purpose with a particular time limit. That's a very good example of programmable money. So last but not the least, this is my slide. And I, I just want to say that where are we going with this? I think the history of money is long and old. Uh, there's been money as long as there have been human beings. There's been a barter system. We have gone through that. We have gone through metals and metal coins. We've gone through shells. Then we've gone to paper money. Then we had you know, sort of the idea of credit, the idea of credit cards. We have all kinds of P2P wallets. And then, then we have cryptocurrencies. And if you look at now through that old journey that they see on this diagram, uh, you know, for the 21st century, as we look forward, the idea of uh, digital fiat money, which is also programmable, seems to be the idea of the century or the idea of our times. And that's what RBI is working on. That's what all central banks are working on. And that's where the future is headed. So I'll stop right there. And uh, I think I'm done with my deck. Yep, I am. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I think uh, at every point uh, during this uh, conversation, this uh, lecture, I was only uh, talking to myself that uh, the huge disruption that is unfolding in front of our eyes, you have delivered at uh, bullet train speed. And in spite of that, uh, look like, you know, I have bitten something much more than what I can chew. Uh, but, but then we need to, we need to save a lot more time for questions and answers. And so I will not summarize. I will not make any attempt at this stage. I'll quickly request uh, Professor Prasad to come in. We will start the Q&A. Please start the first uh, cluster just for the benefit of uh, our esteemed speaker and also the audience. I want to mention that all these questions we've collected at the time of registration, they, they key in a question and all the questions are landscaped properly and clustered in order to have a sequential discussion with the speaker. So the first cluster, Professor Prasad will take over. And I welcome uh, Professor Mahendra Reddy, who has joined, and other leaders who are in the audience. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, we don't have time. We have digital money with us. Let's go straight to Professor Prasad with the first cluster. Thank you, Professor Rao. Uh, Dr. Paul, that was, uh, as someone remarked, it was a masterclass. And I think in very, very simple terms, 
you have covered uh, a large terrain and uh, you have uh, in a manner of speaking you have shown us the potential as well as why th these are really game changers some of them you have pointed out i think uh, due to lack of time i'll come straight to the point and the first question was another interesting development which is being talked about right now is the uh, ondc and the uh, perspective into which uh, the question comes is what are the kind of opportunities of course uh, i'd like you to take a minute to elaborate on that and then after that what are the opportunities to potential entrepreneurs as well as graduates in these three areas two of which you have elaborated the third one which is being posted sure okay so first let me admit that when this is an area where i'm just barely getting into it myself because i i might be working with a company which is a central player in the space just like 6 years ago i got into this upi thing by you know some sort of happy accident uh, ondc is similarly i think unfolding in front of me as we speak but it's a very early stage area for me but i think the importance of ondc will be the following that you know i mean if you look at uh, i don't know if you are following i mean i guess you all are following this debate of what is web 1.0 2.0 3.0 right so the web 1.0 was very democratic there were web pages everywhere and life was simple and we clicked from one hyperlink to the other went from one page to the other consumed information we were mostly information consumers in the second web 2.0 what happened was certain very powerful companies emerged like amazon facebook google right twitter they have essentially cornered uh and built these you know what we call walled estates right if you enter this empire and you are kind of stuck right you are not going to be able to unlock yourself that easily because you can't survive because once you leave that you know it's like you try to get on whatsapp right many of us i think once upon a time 3 years ago 2 years ago try to say okay no more whatsapp we'll go to signal and i think most of us went back why was that because it was impossible to survive unless the entire network effect was there and all the people that you're working with were there so therefore this uh, the nature of uh, the internet economy lends itself very well to monopolies appearing and if the monopoly is handling a very useful function it builds momentum and traction and there is so much so much that is happening around it that you know you it's impossible to leave so once you check into that hotel you can't get out that's basically how it appears and that's why these companies have so much market cap and so much uh, you know market power and therefore they are under regulatory watch and and all of that I think in the OMDC world, what seems to be the interesting idea, at least at the core of it, and again, I must admit, I'm talking about the core idea, not so much the details, is that if you look at an Amazon or a Flipkart, uh, there is a lot of complaints coming from, uh, you know, merchants who are essentially become captive. So it's one thing to say that I am as a consumer, I have no choice but to buy from Amazon and Flipkart. I mean, that's one kind of monopoly. But the other monopoly that is going uh, unaddressed is the fact that today, if you are a merchant, you are in an extremely difficult place because you can't avoid these guys so you cannot afford to not be on amazon as a merchant if you have something to sell you cannot afford not to be on flipkart if you have something to sell so as a merchant you also are kind of now stuck in this monopoly right this is the web 2.0 phenomenon i just referred to earlier now this is having very serious consequences for example there are lots and lots of uh, studies out there to show that amazon is doing highly anti competitive practices for example let's say you are a merchant who's come up with this really nice t-shirt right and you go online you go to amazon and amazon t-shirt is selling like hotcakes and you are like this big hit you've gone viral your product is viral your brand is viral now amazon is able to see all the merchants offering t-shirts amazon has instrumented analytics and bots across the entire system to see that your t-shirt seem to be the one that is selling so somebody will flag in amazon soon that you know hey you know professor prasad's t-shirt uh, startup is doing so well and there seem to be reason people buy it and there's all this comments out there that people write they will love this t-shirt because of x y and z there are millions of feedback comments and there's some unstructured analysis you do on the data and all of a sudden they discover you know what amazon discovers that boy we have cracked the code on how to build a successful t-shirt now amazon and flipkart have been accused of having their own merchants which are basically nothing but private labeled under their own brand so now you're doing double dealing right you can start a company as amazon which produces the best t-shirt which is like everything that you're doing plus a little more come in and put it every day that look at your price and make it 20% cheaper so all of a sudden you are your business is over because they have essentially overtaken you and they have used your innovation against you right so this is the problem the unlocking the power of this aggregators marketplaces and giving retailers and all these merchants some degree of freedom to interoperate so essentially today you will you may have to sign a contract with amazon saying that if you are offering this product on my platform you can't offer it on flipkart 
or you can't do it on your own, right? All these anti-competitive restrictive practices for to break it, ONDC is essentially interoperability. If I'm a merchant, I should not have to be at the mercy of one aggregator or the other. I should have the ability to be open. And I think that's the, that's a powerful idea. Just like UPI is interoperable, right? No bank can control UPI. No fintech can control UPI because UPI stands above all of this. Similarly, in commerce, in digital commerce, there's a need for opening up the system and unlocking the potential of the economy without letting aggregators having way too much power. So that's, in my view, the power of ONTC. But like I said, there's a lot more that I don't know yet. Fine. So some sort of democracy so that design, you know, a lot of more people have, uh, uh, yeah. people can take the results of design as well as, uh, you know, others can take the benefit without somebody coming in the middle. So something like a king being removed and some more, you know, democracy, some sort of a democracy coming in. Correct. That's right. Okay. So the other part of the question was uh, uh, with respect to the, the first two and perhaps some of the third, uh, uh, the third kind of you know, concept that we are talking about. Uh, what can potential entrepreneurs and uh, graduates look at? Something large where a lot of people can uh, spend their time and energy to, to get something fruitful. Yeah, okay. This is uh, obviously, uh, you know, a question that is ideal for, you know, startup workshops, right? What, what are we, what, what, where is the innovation going to happen? I think clearly in India, you know, payments innovation, UPI is now the gold standard, right? So that is clearly a great story. There is innovation happening in digital lending. Right. I think uh, you will see a lot of innovation happening around lending because lending, again, banks uh, like my church model to go back to that model, church versus bazaar. And, and if you want to apply for a bank loan and wait for approvals, it could take weeks, sometimes months in a digital lending world that has changed. So I would say digital lending is a very powerful area where innovation is happening as we speak that, you know, I mean, just yesterday, I think there was an announcement from RBI that you know, UPI addresses can now be linked to credit cards, which is like saying you can link it to a overdraft account. So lending is coming in through UPI, in other words. So digital lending is the next frontier. You may have heard expressions like BNPL, buy now, pay later, which is the basic idea of the same thing that you can uh, borrow and then pay digitally, right? So this idea of installment payments, all digital, all through the app, I think is big. Micro insurance is big. India is a very underinsured country. Imagine the ability to actually buy and sell insurance in a democratized world. I think that's a big one for uh, fintech. So in fintech itself, there are at least a dozen areas we can get into, whether it's you know building bots for uh, customer service. If you look at something like Eva, which is HDFC's uh, bot for customer service and customer intelligence, very interactive bots. So building very good quality conversational AI with uh, you know customers is very important. If I just abstract it back, I would say that you know anything to do with AI, data science, machine learning, and blockchain. I think these are fundamental technologies. I think anybody who's kind of got some insight into this and also understand some domain, right? I think I would really focus on the combination of, you know, some solid industry domain and, and these technologies. And I think startups are everywhere in the space. You know, in some ways, there's no such thing as the right thing to do a startup in, but that or innovation in. It all depends upon what you get excited about. The good thing today is that, you know, technology is available. Technology is almost a commodity. Uh, innovation uh, is where you know as good as your idea is and, and i'm happy to talk to people who have specific problems they want to work on happy to give them some feedback if it helps them thank you i think there is a very good direction in what you've said you identified the areas both with respect to startups as well as with respect to architects and i hope uh, uh, many of the executives or the graduates who are sitting in and listening hope to come out with projects in some of these areas which will help us uh, so the next question is about uh, now if you talk about web 3.0 and you know what is happening uh, on the metaverse and metaverse uh, currencies what kind of uh, you know what kind of scenario do you expect to play out in the next two years yeah i think uh, it's a great question i think two years is probably too uh, aggressive a time frame to give a very direct answer as to what will happen but i think there is clearly a sign that the virtual world is becoming bigger and bigger Right, uh, uh, more and more. Uh, if you go back and read uh, Ray Kurzweil, who's one of the most famous futurists of our times, uh, he is the person who came up with Singularity University in, in California, which is a very famous university for future predicting the future. So he said that by 2035, he expects that most people will live most of their daytime in a virtual world. Right. So clearly, metaverse is nothing but the convergence of you know, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, online gaming, 
uh, cryptocurrencies, and then that once you start living in the so-called virtual world and spend a lot of time there, you will start doing transactions, you'll start meeting people, you will buy things, and we've seen this virtual real estate craze, etc., and NFTs. All of this are happening, right? I would say it's a very exciting area to um, explore if you are a young professional. You know, just like I mentioned, uh, AI, blockchain, and data sciences. I would strongly say that if you are also a person who is a creative person who likes to design things, create things. Um, I think it's a great uh, profession for people who want to have a right brain profession with a left brain sort of uh, technology approach to it, right? Metaverse, I think, is very exciting. Uh, but yes, there'll be a lot of hype. We have to live up. I mean, all of technology innovations have a lot of hype in them. But once the hype settles, the dust settles, what is left behind is actually very profound, right? It, it changes the game completely. So therefore, I would say that uh, Metaverse with crypto blockchain, uh, the, the jury is out. Uh, I think we're just starting to see the first generation of hardware devices, our you know helmets and glasses and sensors. And once that starts to happen, I think, yes, I can see that being a very exciting space. But I would say two years is probably too limiting a time frame. One should take more of a five to 10 year horizon. Uh, you know, if you look at e-commerce uh, in 1997, when Amazon first came, or 1995, I think, you know, it's taken 25 years to become what it is, which is nothing. It's like a tiny amount of time in the history of time. But in a lifetime of a human being, it's like one third of your lifetime is spent making one of these models work. Thank you. I think, you know, that uh, kinds of tells us that it's much more into the future than is currently imagined. Uh, uh, I think there's a technical question I'll come into at this stage. You did touch upon it. There are a lot of uh, moving parts uh, possible in the CBDC. So what sort of can you uh, indicate to what sort of architecture what 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 does this moving parts what what does the system look like yeah no i think it's a good question i, I must say that, that that's coming from somebody who's really applying their mind uh, so you know if you look at cbdc right uh, the first generation of cbdc thinking was like you know uh, if rbi or central bank is going to give direct wallets to individuals on their phones uh, so all you have to go is go i mean that, that the world of that we call the direct cbdc one tier architecture uh, the idea was that you know we just go to the RBI website, we download a wallet that is an RBI approved secure wallet. It's a digital currency wallet. And then from that point on, whatever comes into that wallet is a digital currency backed by RBI. So when I'm transferring money from me to you or me to a merchant, all that is happening is it's moving inside the RBI, right? So in other words, account based uh, CBDC single tier. So we need a central bank, we need people with digital currency wallets on their phones, and all is good. Unfortunately, it turns out that central banks are terrible at handling retail customers, right? Uh, and they are only good at handling, you know, intermediaries like banks. And that's how the whole banking system is a two-tier system. You know, uh, RBI is the bank for banks and banks are the banks for common people and companies. So therefore, we have historically the economic architecture of banking architecture assumes that the function of customer service relegated to the banks, commercial banks and commercial banks will lean upon the central bank. To get its own, uh, you know, services. So, so that 2D architecture, I think, is the foundational, you know, I would say, structure of uh, the economy. So, I think, I think wisdom has prevailed to say that, boss, you can't completely turn this upside down. And RBI is going to be terrible at it. Can you imagine calling RBI and saying, you know, what, I'm, my money payment has gone wrong. Can you help me trace my money? No one's going to answer your call for one year, right? So that's not going to happen. Customer service is not their priority. So long story short, you're back to the same. Now we're talking about, okay, therefore it should be like a two-tier architecture. It should be like, you know, but, uh, there'll be wholesale CBDC that the uh, RBI will give to the bank like it does today, wholesale. Banks will come around giving me, give me a retail CBDC and give me a wallet. So I'll get still get a Bank of Baroda wallet or a SBI wallet, but we're a digital currency wallet. And for all practical purposes, from that point on, the money is digital and it's, you know, like a fiat money. So I think a 2D architecture is on the cards with wholesale retail CBDC separation. I don't think banks are going to be put out of business. Uh, I think the, if anything, there'll be more fintech payment solution providers who will play the, role, play the role of kind of quote unquote light banks or neo banks in this system and architecture. So I think the way open banking, neo banking is going, the fintechs are going, you take the, that with CBDC. I think you get a very robust reinforcement of the 2 tier architecture uh, and the CBDC as you reflect it. So don't expect any radical shift in the landscape of institutions. What will change is the nature of delivery, how we get money. Maybe the ATMs will vanish. I think the ATMs are the first one to vanish. We'll not need cash, paper cash. We will not even need a leather wallet in our pocket. Uh, I think what we will have is a digital currency wallet 
we will draw money from our accounts. So, for example, if you uh, draw, you know, 2000 rupees on your digital wallet, you will next morning you can check in net banking, you will see that your savings account has come down by 2000 and the money has moved to your wallet, right? So, just like paper comes out of your account and you are used to it, it will now move instead of paper coming out of an ATM, it will be digital currency coming into your wallet. That's about the primary change. After that, you know, consumers don't really understand settlement and clearing, so it won't affect them very much. But I think behind the scenes, the economy will become more efficient. All the examples I gave, uh, we'll have a much more efficient, robust, you know, easily traceable, monitorable economy, a lot of benefits. And of course, we are all now going to be at the mercy of the RBI to pretty much figure out what we're doing. Excellent. I think uh, some of these uh, major frameworks, concepts, platforms getting married with consumer behavior and then therefore, you know, uh, getting uh, kind of constructed across so many different players to make it friendly right. to customers and unserved customers and what have you. Thank you very much. I think for want of time, I'm closing my cluster here and handing it back to Professor Rao. Thank you very much. Sir. I think we've been uh, going through some of the fantastic uh, responses to these questions. Uh, uh, whenever there's a landscape change like this, uh, a lot of queries would come up and similarly, the audience has uh, uh, shared several questions with us, but I'll, I'll just take a couple of them so that uh, we answer part of the core questionnaire that we would have with us. So the first one is uh, privacy and data security are major issues with digital money. How can technology ensure this privacy and security? Yeah. No, I think this That's is... This is this is a holy grail problem. Sorry, uh, did you finish your question? The line is a little choppy, Mr. Zakar. I think it's frozen. Should I go ahead and respond? The question is talking about uh, yeah, addressing uh, privacy and data security issues. I got that. Yeah. Okay. Fair. So, um, I, like I said, you know, this is unfortunately the more digital we get, the more uh, traceable we become, right? Um, so, in a sense, there is an inherent conflict. They say that what is the most private computer in the world? The one that has no connection to the internet, right? The most secure computer. So, if you want to make a computer really secure, make sure it does nothing with the world that it interacts with, right? There's no interaction with the world. So, in other words, uh, digital economy, uh, by its very definition, is antithetical to the idea of too much privacy. Because efficiency can come only when not, there's not too much privacy, right? We can trace things faster, more efficiently, etc. Uh, I mean, just think of the irony, right? The irony we have today is in this country, on one side, there are people who are saying we should have a privacy bill, right? And that's like, you know, the, it's a big thing. You know, there's an entire movement around the world, not just India, GDPR in Europe, for example. But the point being that there is a clear understanding that privacy of information is very important, right? And people are getting exploited. But at the same time, we are all very happy to have a free YouTube account because we don't want to pay a subscription of 120 rupees to YouTube for subscription because a free YouTube account is running on advertising. So we are happily giving away our private information every minute that we click on YouTube links all day long. And that information is being used against us or used to feed us advertising. So just look at our own behavior. At a very fundamental human level, we want something free for which we're willing to give up all data about ourselves. And on the next time, next breath, we can say that we don't have enough privacy. We need laws to protect us from these you know, technology companies that are using our information against us. So I think the fundamental split, the, the dichotomy is at the very fundamental human nature. We want stuff for free. We want privacy. And those two things don't you know, gel well, right? They don't live together as a concept. So that's the starting point. So I think, yes, my sense is that the RBI or central banks will, uh, and so will the commercial banks, with CBDC architectures, they will certainly give us options to do something about our wallet like for example i'm imagining that when you spend money from your digital wallet you may be able to sort of make certain transactions anonymous what that means is that the algorithm will support the idea that a consumer should be able to control certain transactions those transactions will happen but you know you will not be able to i mean it will you can never prevent the system from knowing who's got the money but the purpose may be you know possible to hide right so i i'm actually at one level i think the picture I had earlier that for all the dozen benefits we'll see in CBDC, the surveillance state is, I think, inevitable. I would argue that someone like China is a leader in CBDC for precisely that reason. They want to track their, their citizenry. In fact, if money goes out of paper into CBDC, one of the major unspoken benefits that a, a authoritarian government can have 
is tight control of people's money movement, right? Just like they have put AI cameras in street corners to say that if you are jaywalking and they will send you a ticket and they'll name and shame you on every public digital bulletin board, right? Similarly, I think uh, authority, authority in states are going to take the lead in CBDCs because it gives them very tight control over visibility of people's money movement. So knowledge is power and knowledge about money transactions is even bigger power. So I don't see a fundamental ability to avoid this problem. There'll be a lot of attempts from citizens and private organizations to say that you know, anonymity is important, privacy is important, but that will have, I think, not a very different fate than what has happened to advertising, digital advertising and privacy laws. Fair enough. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for that detailed uh, response on how we choose between privacy and the disrupt benefits of disruption that's happening. And it is not just restricted to this one, but it is common to various other benefits that we have been accruing uh, from other disruptions as well. Uh, so th the next query is about, uh, given the financial uh, literacy in the country, is India ready for a digital currency? Oh, this is the question. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's a good question. It appears to be that, yes, somehow, because we're technologically, our literacy is low. But I think, and I tell you, uh, I'm, I've been back in India now almost 17 years after you know my US stint, uh, et cetera. But I, I am really impressed by how far ahead we are now as a country, digitally speaking, right? I mean, Aadhaar, nobody has it, but our Aadhaar works, right? If you look at uh, UPI, my goodness, what a success story, right? And uh, I mean, UPI is going to have voice activated. So if you are a vernacular speaker who's illiterate, you can transfer money in a vernacular language by giving a voice command. I mean, that's where UPI is headed, right? So in that way, I think our ability to first adapt to our conditions and use technology, you know, frugal engineering, as we call it, right? We are, I think, become masters of frugal engineering. The India stack is a good example. I think we become very good frugal software engineers as a country. We are able to solve very hard, large scale, citizen scale problems. UPI is an example of that. Other is an example of that. Fastag is an example of that. ONDC will be an example of that. All of this suggests to me that literacy is not really a precondition for financial uh, performance or abilities, right? Um, today, I think uh, there is enough evidence that uh, we are going to be able to do very well in these areas. So that's one part. I think UPI has already shown that uh, people are doing really well with UPI. On the other hand, um, I think CBDC in some sense, I think given how much we live in our smartphones already uh, in this country, and again, I understand that feature phones are still going to be here for another five or 10 years, but it's tapering off really fast. Uh, smartphones, people below a certain age, a digital currency. I mean, think about how, you know, uh, a generation of people today who are in their early thirties or, you know, first job, second job, they never, they've never seen a branch of a bank, right? They've never gone there. So, so they're perfectly happy with the mobile banking solution. So for a mobile banking user who's the age of 27, 28, 29, and India's average is 29, if they've never gone to bank and, and barely gone to an ATM, now you stop going to the ATM, that's it. CBDC will make sure that you don't have to go to even to an ATM, forget about going to a branch, which you never been to anyway, right? So in that sense, I think it is naturally fitting in. CBDC is a natural progression of the mobile application smartphone behavior of our youth. Uh, some of us will complain that, yeah, this is too much technology, but I think, you know, like all technologies, you know, for one generation, it is a disruption. The next generation is like the most natural thing in the world. Fantastic, sir. Thank you very much. So India is ready for this uh, digital currency, and there is enough of uh, track record in the recent history in the last five years, as we have seen some of the stats uh, presented by you. Uh, so the next question is about, uh, will CBDC replace cryptocurrency? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Um, see, the point is that why did cryptocurrencies become popular? The people who are following the cryptocurrency as a religion, cryptocurrency is like a religion, right? You believe that central banks are bad. You believe that any money governed by central banks is even worse because, I'll tell you why, the last 20 years, governments around the world, central banks are printing money right and left. So if tomorrow morning a central bank wakes up and says that I want to double the money I'm printing, I can reduce the savings account of each of us by 50%, our savings, the value of a savings account can go down by 50% because the money supply is doubled because of printing, right? So in other words, central banks have become, in the eyes of this category of people, untrustworthy as protectors of individual wealth. Central banks are not responding to people's wealth creation needs. They are just printing money and diluting everybody's financial you know, resources. That is the argument of people who believe in crypto. They want to keep their money outside the reach 
of any nation state, any central bank. Now, those guys are not going to come to CBDC because CBDC is, again, by definition, owned and run and operated by the central bank. So the guys who have gone to crypto for that, you know, so-called, you know, what I call the, the Robin Hood kind of reason, right? They want to be an outlaw by definition. They are not going to suddenly follow the law because it's in digital form. So CBDC is not for those guys who are doing Bitcoin and Ether as a religion. So that way it will not change. But the people who are coming into crypto for the first time thinking that digital currency is an investment and somehow, you know, they're making money, etc. But CBDC, I think, will only put a limited amount of stock to the idea that, you know, I mean, people who are, using, I mean, most people are using crypto for investment. And CBDC is nothing, it's not like investment. CBDC is just a payment instrument, right? There's a difference between instrument of payment and instrument of investment, right? So CBDC is essentially going to make our, you know, sort of, uh, payment seamless and yes and central banks have a lot of PR saying that look we have adopted the idea of digital currency we have such a lovely digital currency with all these fancy nice features which can do all these wonderful things and you can have more protection this that but I don't think anybody who really understands why they're doing crypto in the first place is going to fall for a CBDC so the two worlds will continue to exist the paper money of the central bank will become CBDC the money of crypto will remain in the crypto world Fantastic, sir. That's a very, very clear uh, answer uh, to that question. I'm not able okay, to... Let, yeah. let, me, let me read out, sir. John Keynes uh, had outlined the motives of holding money, uh, that is transactionary, precautionary, and speculative motives. Do they hold true of CBDC too? Does hybrid CBDC have the best of the both the worlds? That's the question, sir. Well, I think that that will stump me because I must admit that I'm not an economist. So my knowledge of, uh, you know, macroeconomics and, and, and general stuff is not great. But I would say that, you know, uh, I think CBDC, first and foremost, architecturally is as good as what money has been for central banks for at least the last hundred years, right? So CBDC only makes two fundamental shifts. I think if you're an economist, you know, like I said before, it's M0. So it is not going to give you anything different than what banknotes are giving, right, to you in the, as a concept. But I think the two most important things I tried to highlight, and I can underscore them one last time, is that what makes it novel is that it's a digital fiat currency. In other words, it's, a, it's still a fiat currency. It is still you know, backed by the sovereign, it has still got the same purposes, but because the digital has some extra benefits, and one of them is efficiency of transmission, efficiency of, uh, you know, making it more secure, etc. And the other part, so that part, I think, is just more efficient way of getting, uh, you know, uh, fiat money across the table. I think that's digital fiat currency. That's the first step. The part that I think has the most interesting long-term potential is programmability. We don't know what that really means yet. It's very early days. Even the example I gave you of vaccination, is a very simple example. I mean, anybody can understand it, right? What is not clear is that, you know, for example, I'll just give you some more examples. Like, I think as we start to look at money being a programmable object or code that you can program to achieve certain outcomes or match certain constraints. I mean, for example, we talk about escrow accounts, right? When, when people do a complex, large ticket transaction like buying land, they put money in escrow to make sure the legal aspect of that escrow is properly handled so that money doesn't leave too soon or arrive too soon at a particular uh, person's hands, right? So if you think of that, an escrow, is, then if money can be programmed, then escrows are not required, right? So that is the nature of financial services offered around legal money, how to move money legally with rules. So money with rules can be done in the digital world. So I think that's where, in my view, the future interesting experiments, innovation will happen, that what happens when money can carry its own rules with it and how it will be used, how it will be deployed, where it will sit, where it will not sit. What can you do with this money? What can you not do with this money? That's where I think we'll have some very interesting innovation. And that may be the future of money itself. So I don't know if I answered the question, but I thought, to me, it starts off looking very simple, looking very logical and simple extension of the way things are. But moment you get into this area of programmability, suddenly it appears that the sky is the limit of what you can do. Fantastic, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we have covered a huge canvas uh, at this point in time with respect to digital money and the history of and the evolution of money itself. Uh, sir, uh, I, I'm, I'm very sorry, I've taken a little more time than I have asked for. Uh, uh, you are required to go to airport, I understand that, and we will conclude it here uh, without much uh, of any additional remarks from any one of us. Uh, we, want, we want to thank on behalf of everyone who have joined this session. Uh, this has been a hugely insightful 
and very crystal clear kind of articulation from you has helped us decode the subject, some of the layers that I hold in this, and also the perspectives have helped us, you know, apply our mind to and read a little more about it and keep on watching with uh, clear uh, uh, eyes open uh, uh, to, to, to watch how this uh, space is going to emerge and we are going to be affected by all of us. Some of the interesting points that you mentioned is that the ATMs will vanish and our leather wallets will definitely uh, find no place in our pockets. It's not required. Uh, we will be uh, extremely happy to write to you with additional questions that we have. Uh, the picture that you have painted in with respect to how the banks have completely disrupted, how technology software has helped us look at customer centric uh, uh, focus and uh, from compliance to so the institutions are now complying with the customer requirements, which was vice versa before. And from there on to now, and India's track record in the UPI uh, has given us a greater confidence that we are ready for digital currency and the efficiency part and the programmable object of digital currency uh, clears us and helps us to understand the specific benefits for this. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, for want of time, I'm, I'm rushing through and I would like to thank you on behalf of uh, our entire ICFI community and all the participants who have joined for this 59th uh, conversation. Thank you so much, sir. We will get back to you. I'll share the summary and the video link for this recording. Thank you, thank sir. You so much. Thank it was you. a pleasure being here. I appreciate all your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we conclude this uh, 59th conversation. We look forward to uh, having you back with us on the next Friday, that is June 17th at 4 p.m. Uh, we are going to have Lob Sang Fun Sok. Uh, he's a transformative learning leader from Arunachal Pradesh. We will connect with him on some of the important aspects of combining heart, mind, and body into transformative learning. See you at 4 p.m. on June 17th. Till then, do take care and read more about digital money. Thank you.